Welcome to Perkins eLearning's webinar series. My name is Robin Sitton, welcoming you to today's presentation, Leisure Through Technology. Perkins eLearning webinars are presented throughout the year on a monthly basis. You may register to attend live at no fee or view recorded webinars at a time and place that suits your schedule. You can see our entire listings at our website, perkinselearning.org. Today's presentation by Lindsay Lush and Jessica Ehrlich will focus on the recreation and leisure area of the expanded core curriculum through the use of common technology and assistive devices. We're recording this in June of 2015 on the Perkins campus. When viewing this recorded presentation, you will find that headphones, earbuds, or external speakers give the best sound. Lindsay Lush is a teacher and assistive technology liaison for Perkins Lower School and Early Learning Center and a member of the Educational Programs Advisory Committee. Jessica Ehrlich has worked as an itinerant TBI for Perkins Community Programs since 2007 and was recently appointed Assistant Education Director of Community Programs. And we're so pleased that they were able to spend time with us today. Uh, let me introduce you to, to Jessica and we'll get started. Good morning. The primary focus of our presentation will be on covering access methods, computer software, iPad apps, and different iPad adaptations. We need to first review the difference between core curriculum and expanded core curriculum. Core curriculum is everything a student needs to know before graduating high school. It's always pertaining to academics. When we think about expanded core curriculum, these are skills that are required for instruction for students that are visually impaired and blind. These skills are required to be taught explicitly through instruction that the student's peers are most likely going to learn from with incidental learning. So incidental learning is a form of indirect, additional, or unplanned learning within a formal or an informal setting. I like to think about when I was younger, driving down the street, passing the McDonald's. I recognized that that big M meant McDonald's. This is something that visually impaired and blind students aren't going to pick up on. Explicit learning is direct planned teaching. And this neat type of instruction is needed because students with visual impairments don't develop the skills just by observation. Once I had a student who thought laundry came out of the dryer folded already. We have to explicitly teach our students so they understand what they're supposed to be learning. Technology and leisure skills are required to have direct instruction. These skills are just as important as the core curriculum. I think another time when I had a student who I had to explicitly teach how to plug in headphones. This might be something that's very important to put on the IEP. A student with vision can do it with ease, but a student without vision needs explicit instruction. Let's review the nine areas of the expanded core curriculum. We have technology, which we'll be talking about today, career education, compensatory skills, independent living, orientation and mobility, recreation and leisure, self-determination, sensory efficiency, and social interaction skills. All important skills for students with visual impairments and blindness, and all need to be explicitly taught. Let's talk now about some options for students with multiple disabilities. We will review access methods, monitors, displays, and touchscreens, different switches, Bluetooth, wireless, and hardwired, auto scanning versus step scanning, and then we'll review some different types of software we use here on campus, board maker, switch skill scanning, and big bang pictures. First, we're gonna review some different types of viewing screen. Screen size are, is very important. Smart boards are wonderful. They have a very large display, and sometimes people think bigger is better. Uh, this is not always true. We have to remember that um, sometimes a screen could just be too big for our students. However, a smart board offers touchscreen capabilities, which is great for some students. On the far right, there is the tappet, which is really great for students who are in wheelchairs. There is a little bit of a space at the bottom of the tappet machine that fits a wheelchair, and the, the tappet screen has a lot of different flexible positions so that you can get very close for a student who has limited range of motion or needs a specific angle for viewing. 
Um, on campus, we also use ELOs, which are a very standard monitor display with a touch screen. These are good for students with pretty good vision. However, um, the, the display can be a little bit muddled, and it's important to decide if that's too muddled for your student. On campus, we also just use very large displays. On the bottom, that ACES screen is about a 26-inch monitor, and it has a very bright screen, very sharp display, which is great for some students who maybe do not need a touch screen. Um, next, let's review switches. Switches come in a huge variety of shapes and sizes, and they really depends on what you need for your students' specific needs. Bluetooth work great with laptops and iPads. They're actually, they used to be the only switch that works with an iPad. However, recently um, a company called Orin has made a Tapio um, switch interface, which now you can use a hardwire switch. But we tend to use the Bluetooth switches. This is a Bluetooth. It um, works as a switch itself or also a switch interface, which is really nice. It gives you the capability to be portable, but if your student requires certain switches, you can plug into it and use the switches they're most familiar with. On the far right is a wireless switch and a transponder. You plug in the transponder to a desktop computer with the switch interface, and then you have the capability of walking all around the room. Your student could be on one side of the room um, working, and you could be activating the computer on the other side. Hardwire switches come in a huge variety. Um, we have the Gucci switch, which is shaped like a half moon. It can vibrate, light up, and has a very jelly-like texture. This is really great if a student with um, needs a lot of bells and whistles to reach out and press the switch. Um, however, it can be way too much. Typically, when we're doing a scanning activity where we begin using two switches, we'll have maybe a Gucci switch for the step switch and a more simple switch for the other one because we really want to emphasize a different texture. The gumball switch, jelly bean, and buddy buttons are all very similar. However, they do have some slight differences. Gumball and jelly bean switches have the capability to change the color of the caps. So if you're an itinerant teacher, you need a little bit more bang for your buck, this is a great option for you because if you have a student that has different, you have students that have different color preferences, you have the capability of changing the caps. However, because of that, the switches do tend to rattle a little bit. So I prefer to use buddy buttons. They don't have interchangeable colors, so we typically buy red or yellow. Um, but they don't have any rattle, which is really nice for my students. There's definitely some students that have some sound sensitivity. When that rattle, it will really throw them off. Absolutely. Lesson. Playing with it. <laughs> um, and I just want to emphasize that your switch will not work if you do not have a switch interface. So make sure you buy them. In this screen, we're showing one from Don Johnston. That's the one that we typically purchase. They last a very long time. They're pretty resilient, and uh, they work with a variety of different switches. Now let's review auto scanning. Auto scanning is a type of scanning that utilizes one switch. The program that you will be using will be set up automatically to scan through predetermined options or choices. Um, the user activates one switch to make a specific choice and this type of scanning allows for more complex learners to interact with choice making technology or different games. In this video you'll see a student using board maker um, and we've created a Simon Says type game. He's going to use one switch to start the scan, and then he'll use that same switch to make a selection for the teacher to do. Oh, you picked Scarecrow. Stomp your feet. Team jump. Clap or net chorus. Shut the door. Stomp your feet. I want you to stomp your feet. <laughs> you want to do it again? Press your switch. Just <laughs> finished. Guess what? We're doing it again. Stomp your feet. Team jump. Clap or net chorus. Shut the door. Stomp your feet. I want you to stomp dog. your feet. Next, let's talk about step scanning. Step scanning is a type of scanning that utilizes two switches. 
The program you'll use is set so that the student can use one switch to move through predetermined options and the second switch will make the selection. In this video, you'll see a student using a Bluetooth switch. There is a switch on the left that has a smooth texture and a switch on the right that has a little bit of fuzzy Velcro to help him differentiate the texture. He uses the switch on the left to move through the predetermined options and the switch on the right to make his selection. And if you notice in the video, the switches actually turn a little bit on a diagonal. For this student, placement is really important and it helped him to have one switch a little bit higher than the other. So that's something to consider when you're doing any kind of switch activity is making sure that the placement works for your students. Put on bingo. Six. Count to ten. Jump. I want you to jump. Okay, are you ready? ready? Sure. Stomp your feet. And you might want to Velcro it. Yeah. I want you to stomp your feet. <laughs> Whoever's behind us. <laughs> Put on bingo. Six. Count to ten. Jump. I want you to jump. All right, get ready. <laughs> You may have also noticed in the video that he has a little um, dot on the left side of his switch and it's just another texture to help him differentiate between the two switches. Now we're going to review some different types of software we use here on campus. Switch Skills Scanning is a program by Inclusive Technology and it offers a large variety of engaging switch activities. It utilizes musical and visual options to facilitate choice making, and it works really well with students with vision or without vision. It provides a natural progression to choice making. There is a level that we consider to be errorless. The student will get a reaction no matter what they choose, or to more, sophistic to more sophisticated types of scanning, whereas they have a specific target that they need to hit to get a, a reward. In this video, you'll see this student using a yellow and red switch on the left, and it has a gushy texture. With a smaller red switch on the right, it has a soft Velcro on it. He requires different textures. This is Switch Skills Scanning Program, and it is set to errorless. Use the steps. In the video, you can see there's three different boxes, which represent three different musical and visual choices. This student is totally blind and it's engaging enough for him, uh, he really enjoys using it. You'll see he uses the switch on the left to move through the different choices and then when he goes to make a choice he's activating it with the switch on the right. Eat and do it the right way. Good job. Next, let's talk about Board Maker Speaking Dynamically Pro by Mary Johnson. Using this software, we've been able to develop different types of games for students, where in the past we maybe only used it for making pictures or symbols. We've developed an action game, which is similar to Simon Says. We've decided to make a name that tune game where you can play a song in the background with a list of songs and the student can scroll through and pick. Um, and we've developed some different sound effect games, which work really well with both auto scanning and step scanning. The last piece of software we'll talk about today is Big Bang Pictures by Inclusive Technologies. It's a one switch application and it's great for students who are working on cause and effect. It offers a wide range of options, including color, picture, complexity, action duration, and music. And the real nice thing about this program is that for a student who's a little bit older but might function at a lower level, you can use age-appropriate music during the activity. We're going to roll it over into a different topic right now. We're going to talk about applications. On a weekly basis, I get questions. Where am I going to find good apps? Well, let me tell you, you need to do your research. So if it doesn't have a YouTube video about it, it's probably not a really good app, and I wouldn't spend your money on it. Here at Perkins School for the Blind, we have a trial iPad where we can trial really expensive applications and see if they're going to work for our students before making multiple choices. I like an app called Apps Gone Free. It's a free app, and it has apps that are free. 
Usually they put them on for a week or two. They're not always educationally appropriate, but it's a good resource for free information. iBlink Radio is another great app. It has podcasts about technology for students with visual impairments. And VIA by the Braille Institute is a fully accessible app and it's useful for adults and children who are visually impaired and blind to give them information, especially for people with additional disabilities. One of my favorite websites is wonderbaby.org. Wonder Baby is a great resource for parents that are just coming into this experience of having a baby with a visual impairment or blindness. A lot of times, Wonder Baby will do reviews of applications so you know what you're getting into before you fork over the money. Moms with Apps is a really nice website created by moms. It reviews different applications and it has them filed into different categories. So if you're looking for a specific app for a specific age group, you'll be able to locate it easily on this website. So Lindsay, I think one of my most favorite websites is Apple Viz. That's great. It is. I always am telling friends and colleagues to go check it out. Apple Viz is a website that reviews different apps for students with visual impairments. So if you want to try out an app, you should check out Apple Viz first. They'll do a nice job reviewing it. When I explain different applications for leisure to other teachers that of the visually impaired, I like to break it down by different categories. Let's think about early learners and cause and effect applications. As Lindsay talked about software before that was produced by Inclusive Technologies, they also have a few apps that are absolutely excellent. Big Bang Patterns and Big Bang Pictures are a little pricey, but well worth your money. Both of those are great cause and effect apps for very basic learners, and they're excellent for kids that are in phase one CDI. PP Musicians is a great application created also by Inclusive Technologies. It has these little musicians that peep out from side to side on a real black surface. So you're going to be able to see if you have a student who's scanning from left to right. Baby View, Baby Finger, Instant Sim Simulation, and Baby Vision are all real basic cause and effect apps that kind of have a grow with me feature. So when you have a student that's really low functioning and then they start to make progress, that app is gonna grow with them. Tap and See Now by Little Bear is specifically for kids with visual impairments and diagnosis of CBI. I really like the features. You're able to change colors, change background, and even change sounds. Peekaboo Barn is when you grow into a little bit more of a complex visual field, as well as Stop and Go HD. The next category I'd like to talk about is audio accessible applications. These are applications that kids that are totally blind are able to access. So when their friends are out playing Xbox, they have these alternatives to keep themselves busy. Blindfold Racer and Blindfold Sudoku have excellent audio capacity and it's produced by kid-friendly software. Sixth Sense is an app that is all about killing zombies. Truth or Dare is something you can play with your sighted friends. Audio Defense is another zombie killing application. And I don't want to forget about read to go read to go is an application and it pushes books um, in the application so you're able to use it just with audio or you're able to read along with it. I really like this app because I have students that are able to change the font size, the color background, specifically for their needs. Some of our students need tactile feedback, even when they're using the iPad. I have found something called pet tape. If you've ever ordered a refrigerator or an oven that's come to your house, you'll find that pet tape is surrounding this device. So pet tape is sticky, but won't leave any residue. Now I'm going to show you how I've used Beams, a free application, with pet tape to give your students some tactile feedback with the iPad. So as you see, this pet tape is something I just ordered online by Googling PET tape. And then I downloaded on my iPad the free application by Beams. And I've laid over two pieces of the pet tape. This now makes this application tactilely accessible for students who need it. The student knows where to put their finger by feeling the tape. 
At Perkins, on and off campus, we've experimented with lamination overlays with different tactile textures. We also have made hard plastic overlays. I know RJ Cooper has a great website where you can purchase custom-made overlays depending on what application you're using. I'd like to talk about positioning and safety for the iPad. If you're going to invest in an iPad, you really may need to make sure that you're taking care of it. Cases make a difference. Here at Perkins, we love gumdrop cases. They might be a little expensive, but you can drop them on the ground and there's a seal-proof um, case over it, which really makes them protected. Ziploc bags and painter's tape is a great combination to make sure that your iPad's not going to get wet if you need to go into the bathroom or out in the rain to work on a lesson with a student. Slam boards are super important. You need to make sure that positioning is at its utmost. We're really fortunate at Perkins to have an assistive device center where we can walk in and get custom made slam boards. They also make tabletop and wheelchair mounting systems depending on what your students needs are. I'm going to go step by step and explain guided access. It's a feature that I don't think everybody understands. And when you're working with kids with multiple disabilities or infants and toddlers, it's invaluable. So what you're going to do is start in settings. And from settings, you're going to go to general. In general, you'll find accessibility. Make sure you touch that. Once you're in the accessibility feature, you're going to scroll all the way down until you find guided access. It's under learning and you're going to make sure that you turn it on. You turn guided access on by sliding your finger from left to right and you need to create a passcode. I always like to keep my passcodes really simple like 1111 or 1234 something that you're going to ensure that you're not going to forget. So I make my passcode simple, I set it, and I get out of the settings completely. Now you're going to go into an application that you want to use with a student. Up here you see the app I talked about before, Tap and See Now. Once you're in the application, you're going to triple click the Home button. And there'll be a choice to pick Guided Access. You're going to press Start, and you're going to have to type in the access code. So the child is not going to be able to ex exit the application at all when you're in guided access. To get out of guided access, you're going to press triple click home three more times. And you're going to press end. It will probably prompt you for your passcode again, so make sure you didn't forget it. Touch access is a part of guided access. It's pretty cool. Let's say you have an app that you got for free and you really like it, but there's a ton of ads at the bottom. All you have to do is gray out that bottom portion and your student or, or child is not going to have any access to those pre-promotional things that might push you into mail or get you into buying something. So leisure time is super important. There's so much to teach and leisure doesn't always get included. We know that our students need to make independent choices. They need to have time for themselves. Leisure skills, especially through technology, are lifelong skills. Thank you so much for sharing that information. There was a lot of information there and um, great names of apps that people uh, can use for different students and their interests and abilities. So that's really helpful. Before we were putting this uh, webinar together, we had invited people to submit their questions in advance. And I thought we'd just uh, take a few minutes to talk about some of them and see what you had to think about them. Uh, Mariam joined us all the way from Egypt, where she uh, works with students who have disabilities. And uh, her major concern coming into this conversation was about students with multiple disabilities, which of course, here on our campus, we know so well. And I think you addressed many of her questions about what are some techniques that could be used with students who have additional disabilities, particularly talking about positioning and how integral that can be in them having a successful and enjoyable experience. Um, I'm just wondering if you have a sense about some of the apps that you've recommended, whether they are available internationally. It made me think about what, there may be many other apps that we don't know about um, just because we don't have access to them. Have you heard of any that you might recommend? Right, that's a great question. So, Inclusive Technologies is actually from the United Kingdom. 
Great. And um, so I would assume that those are internationally accessible. All the apps that we talked about today are available in the App Store, so they should be available all over the world. Thanks. Um, Vivian is a special education resource room teacher uh, working right now with a fourth grade student who's blind in one eye. Um, and I wondered if you had experience with, with your students who have some available vision and how you incorporate that in some of these activities. So I've had a couple students over the years that have monocular vision, and it really is dependent on the vision in the good eye. So they're always going to have some sort of peripheral loss on the side of where the eye is missing, but you have to just really incorporate everything into the field where they're available to see. Yeah, there's that positioning. Positioning, again. yeah. Yeah. She also mentioned that her student was diagnosed late um, in third grade. Any tips for people who are kind of playing catch up with kids with visual impairments discovered late? So at Perkins School for the Blind, we always recommend a functional vision assessment and a learning and media assessment always to start off and have a baseline so you understand what the usable vision is within the classroom setting. Uh, Judy from West Philadelphia is an OT. She works with kids in the upper teens, um, helping them with their transition. She's been uh, working at HMS school for about 17 years. She says she uh, tells a really nice story about one of her older teens who's become very skilled using Siri and that Siri has now kind of helped him keep up with his friends and the thing and the interests that they share. So they enjoy sports. He can use Siri to read box scores and he can find schedules of games. And uh, it reminded me so much of what you said about finding an age appropriate activity for uh, the student, particularly once they're teenagers and that, um, you know, their ability to fit in with their friends is so important. Are there other activities that have really worked for those older teens, even if they maybe aren't um, functioning maybe cognitively at that level? Well, we have a student center here on campus, and I think that they really explore lots of different sure. options. We have a radio station um, that the kids get to participate in, making different kinds of radio shows. I think that it all comes back to research and exploration. You really need to try things out with your students to see if they're going to be applicable. Uh, Millie uh, wrote to us, uh, she's also at HMS School, and, and um, she, had a, she had a particular app that she really enjoyed using that's been discontinued. Mm -hmm. And uh, it made me think about, you know, how, how apps do often get discontinued for a variety of reasons. Or sometimes they actually get upgraded, but they get upgraded in a way that functionally doesn't really work for your student anymore. <laughs> Jessica, you mentioned a lot of uh, places you go to stay up to date on new apps, apps gone free. You mentioned iBlink and VIA. Uh, is there other um, reading or networking you do to kind of keep up with devices and apps? Yeah, I get a newsletter from um, tidbits, um, Tech Tidbits every week that just gives a little recap on what's going on in the world and just networking with different colleagues. Uh, we have an organization um, through Massachusetts, the Association of Massachusetts Educators mm -hmm. of Students with Visual Impairments, and that list serves always a wonderful resource for what's new and up and coming. I also think just to go back to my students, because they really know what's up and coming, I learn more from them than I do from any research I'm going to do online. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, that, uh, that app that Millie mentioned was, it was called Front Row, and I, I'll include a note on that uh, on the webinar site just explaining that it is compatible only with sort of back, um, back versions of Apple, but she's had a, a lot of good success with it and choice making and also having students choose their own um, That's a leisure. decent point, too, just to mention. Sometimes you don't always want to update everything. They don't always keep up with that, mm -hmm. and so you may not want to update your iOS. You may not want to update your app. That is a good point, and sometimes it's worth it, in, it, particularly in a resource room setting, to maybe keep an older machine mm -hmm. around for reasons like that. Um, we're always so grateful to get new equipment, <laughs> and you never want to turn that down, but a good point, Lindsay, that sometimes keeping an older version can be something that you need. We have upwards of 300 iPads on and off campus here at Perkins, and we really let the industry figure out what the bugs are before we make that jump mm -hmm. into the next iOS upgrade. Um, and thanks to all of you for participating by sending in your questions and continuing to do the work that you do with our students. You can earn credits for having viewed this webinar by visiting perkinselearning.org and look for this title and you will find an assessment that you can take to earn ACVREP credits 
continuing education or professional development points. And join us next time for uh, as our webinar series continues. Thanks. Thanks, Robin.